there is a basis in Islam for a Muslim to use an axe to kill disliked people. To kill disliked people. And we need to directly deal with and address the problems we have in Islam at their very roots. In the spirit of love, I no longer want to see anyone misled or hurt by false beliefs or wrong choices. Wrong choices that could lead to extremism, radicalization, or even terrorism. Extremism, radicalization, or even terrorism. Chapter 2, verse 256 says that there is no compulsion in religion. So Islam teaches that you cannot force somebody to do anything when it comes to their faith in God. Faith in God is something that only comes by the will of God. And God guides those whom he chooses, those people who are open and who desire the truth. Also the Quran says in chapter 16, verses 125, and I'm going to quote the Quran here, it says... Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them in the ways that are best and most gracious for thy Lord knowest best who have strayed from his path and who have received guidance. So Allah Almighty God here is saying in the Quran chapter 16 verse 125 that you are not to spread Islam by the sword or through terrorism or through force or through any other evil means. So, and myself, of course, as an example, in, in modern times, and many other thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of uh, Western people from Christian backgrounds, particularly in North America and Europe, we are also converting to Islam. Nobody is forcing us to convert. In fact, I've said in my, co my convert uh, video about my conversion story, that I was actually told to leave the mosque and go away, basically, and come back only when I was ready and sure about the religion of Islam, should I become a Muslim. Is the religion of Islam a fundamentalist, terrorist, evil religion? And are Muslims fundamentalist, fanatical terrorists? The answer is no. In a research carried out by a professor of statistics and using statistical techniques to analyze the occurrence of extremist acts among the religious groups in Egypt, it was shown that the number of terrorist acts that were initiated by members of the Islamic religion was 64.6% .6 of the total terrorist acts, 20.4% were initiated by Christians, and those of uncertain religious orientation carried out 15%. And you can also see that from figure number one there. This means that if the number of incidents from each religious group is taken, is stated rather, in proportion to the population of that group, the extremist acts from the Christians are greater than those from the Muslims. This leads us to a very important conclusion. The size of the problem of extremism amongst the Muslims is greatly exaggerated, beyond its true size. I've been getting a lot of hate messages from Christians in particular, criticizing me and rebuking me for teaching Islam on the internet and for leaving my former religion of Christianity. Um, however, and I want to say this from the very beginning, that it's not all Christians who are anti-Islamic and Islamophobic, although it does seem to be a trend amongst the Christian Christians to have that um, those ideas or those feelings towards Muslims and Islam in general. And I certainly saw this trend also when I was in Egypt um, studying Arabic. I lived in Cairo. And I noticed the uh, Christians there, the Coptic Egyptian Christians, had that tendency to be Islamophobic against Muslims as well. Of course, they exposed their hatred to me a lot because they didn't know I was Muslim. I look at me, I look like a typical Westerner. I do not look like a Muslim. And I got into a discussion with this man. I could clearly see he was a Christian. He was wearing a cross on his neck. He had pictures of their, uh, their Orthodox priests on the wall. 
And he said to me, basically, I don't know how we got into the discussion, but he said to me, you know, the Muslims here are the real problem. They're the ones causing all the trouble, and basically they're all terrorists, and they're all, you know, just the root of all evil, basically. And he was quite anti-Islamic. And uh, anyway, he asked me, he said, by the way, why are you here in Egypt in the first place? What brought you all the way here from North America? And I said to him, I'm learning Arabic. And he goes, oh, that's interesting. Why are you learning Arabic? And I said, because I'm a Muslim. And at that point, he, he was shocked, basically. His jaw almost hit the, the ground because he was just slandering my faith and speaking bad about my brothers and sisters in Islam. And uh, there you go. His hatred was exposed to me because he didn't know I was Muslim. So the Quran says, I'm going to quote from the Holy Quran here, Quite a number of the people of the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians, wish they could turn you back to infidelity after ye have believed. Wish they could turn you back to infidelity after ye have believed from selfish envy after the truth hath become manifest unto them but forgive them and overlook until Allah accomplishes his purpose for Allah has all power over all things the Quran chapter 2 verse 109 the Center for American Progress investigated how much money is being spent on Islamophobia in America and they found in their investigation that seven major charities or foundations have donated to the cause and the amount of money that they have donated is 42.5 million dollars counterterrorism training has become a big industry right now and fake ex-terrorists like Walid Shabbat are being paid by American taxpayers for their training in spreading Islamophobia. I say he's a fake terrorist because this man has been exposed. For example, CNN and the Israeli police have found no record of him ever being a terrorist or committing acts of terrorism. I can go on and on and on about other individuals who are Islamophobic and who are spreading prejudice against Muslims around the world today. And many of them have made a lot of money in this Islamophobe industry that we see on the rise today. Of course, Ayan Hershey Ali is one of them. And uh, her excuse for leaving Islam and becoming a hate monger is, is ridiculous. She said she left Islam because of what Bin Laden did or what some group did. Again, it's silly. You, you don't leave your religion or reject your religion based on what a person or a group does. And of course, I don't need to go on about Mrs. Uh, Hershey Ali. We all know about how she lied in her immigration to get into Holland, and that's a, that's a whole different story. So, basically, in today's world, we're living in a time of ignorance. The majority of the masses of people that watch media channels like Fox News and listen to or read the materials of individuals like Walid Shabbat and Robert Spencer and Ali Sina and Ayan Hershey Ali and all of these other individual Sam Shimon etc uh, the majority of people are being brainwashed by these individuals and these uh, news channels why is it dangerous to listen to individuals like this like Robert Spencer, Walid Shabbat and all their Islamophobic hate mongering why is it dangerous to listen to these people and to read their, their materials well the answer goes brings us back to the Christian terrorist Anders Breivik in Norway. He cited 64 times in his manifest, manifesto the writings of Robert Spencer and Walid Shabbat among, amongst other uh, Islamic uh, hate-mongering uh, uh, hate people. But for me, as an ex-Muslim, I've started my day by dealing with Islamic death threats made against me. Let's read some of the comments in my recent video titled, Why I Left Islam. 
at the bottom in the very last line, Sarah A says, quote, you are a proof why a Muslim who leaves Islam should be killed. That when you're faced with terrorism, intimidation, threats, you have two choices. You give in and surrender, or you fight. And I, um, I find the stance to fight more persuasive. And you don't know whether you're going to win or not, but at least you know, defend yourself, fight. Um, I'm glad I'm still alive. <laughs> um, Muhammad Telbani reminds us of the teaching of Islam by saying, quote, so you have three days if you don't get back to Islam after answering your questions, you must be killed as kafir. Muhammad Telbani reminds us of the teaching of Islam. Does the religion of Islam teach Muslims to go out and kill apostates after leaving Islam? The answer is no. Islam teaches that the renunciation of faith is something between God and man and that the penalty for or punishment for apostasy will be uh, postponed until the Day of Judgment. In fact, Islamic law only has punishments for the benefit of human beings to protect their lives and their wealth. In the Holy Quran, the Word of God, there is not a single mention of the death penalty for apostates, and apostasy is mentioned at least 20 times in the Quran. There is no evidence to suggest that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, ever had someone killed for apostasy alone. In Islamic teachings, though, if a Muslim apostates peacefully from Islam, then there is no death penalty for him. Two examples I can give you during the time of the Prophet Muhammad illustrate this point exactly. Number one, Ubaidullah ibn Jash, who became a Christian in Ethiopia, and number two, Abdullah ibn Sa'd, who became an idol worshipper. So these examples clearly show that the Prophet Muhammad did not kill apostates, in fact he was very tolerant towards them. Going back to treason again, treason is not unique to Islam. In fact, many countries like the United States and countries in Europe have killed people for the crime of high treason. So now that we've looked at the Hadith literature, let us go back to the Holy Quran, the Word of God. Does the Quran teach us to kill the apostates? And the answer is no. On the contrary, the Quran teaches freedom of faith, according to chapter 2, verse 256. And it also says the same thing in chapter, 20, in chapter 15, verses 2 to 3 and chapter 18 verse 29. The Quran teaches that a person can apostate time and time again even without the death penalty. The Quran chapter 4 verse 137. The Quran teaches that apostates are to be punished not in this life but in the next life according to chapter 5 verse 54 and chapter 16 verses 106 to 109. There are other verses which do not mention punishments for apostates and freedom of religion for them instead chapter 24 verse 54 chapter 42 verse 6 and many many other verses that I don't have time to mention right now he instead waits for them to repent and return to Islam Allah gives us freedom of choice freedom of belief freedom of religion and he will forgive us if we repent and come back to Islam but if we do not come back to Islam then Allah will deal with us on the day of judgment